next session. Um, we have throw the book out, why CIAM deviates from a conventional uh, authentication security paradigm. And our speaker this afternoon is Vittorio Bertocci. Thank you. Thank you. Buongiorno everybody and welcome. Thank you for making your way from this fantastic lunch offered by the FADO Alliance to come here and spend the next 25, not moving, so I have forever. They can go on forever. And they are still not moving. No, it's, OK, perfect. He will do it by hand. High technology. Great. The next, uh, to whatever David decides, uh, to think about how CIM is different when it comes to being attacked than workforce. My name is Vittorio Bertacci. I work in of zero, uh, Octa as an architect, and I occasionally come out to do these little talks, but my day job is actually to work on features and standards. So, if you walk out of this room with anything, I'd like it to be this. That if you did a really good job of protecting your workforce identity solutions, congratulations. But don't think that uh, you'll be able to take that thing verbatim and apply it to whatever you have customer facing. And I will substantiate these uh, with uh, some uh, high-level ideas, concepts, pillars. And then I'll do something that uh, um, of zero started doing last year, and we did this year as, as well, which is uh, um, we release a yearly report on what we observe on how our CIM customers are attacked and uh, what uh, techniques help to contain the damage of those attacks. Um, Today, during a keynote, actually, it, that the report was mentioned, and I mentioned it on Slack, and everyone was delighted that it was mentioned in there. And it goes in so much more details than what I will do here. So at the end, I'll give you the URL on how to download it. So basically, I'm just going to do this. Talk a bit about high-level differences. I will do the core of the presentation, which is a deep dive on two particular scenarios, two particular types of attacks. I'll talk a bit about countermeasures, and then if I don't burn the entire time, I'll also do a little demo. I was hoping to be the only one doing a live demo, but Christian kicked it out of the park. He did a fantastic demo, so I needed to accept that. Fine, okay? The doors are still open if you don't like it. By all means, I don't have an ego, you can go. No one? Perfect. It's a lie, I do have an ego, and it's enormous. OK, don't take pronunciation advice from me, or you will not go very far. But that's like uh, I wanted to place this definition in here to start, because uh, um, and this definition comes from the Gartner website, so pretty neutral. Uh, the thing is that a lot of people, when they say CIM, they think consumer. I see people on that side uh, of the aisle that might have uh, this idea, third row. <laughs> <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, but in fact, the C stands for customer. Let's say that uh, the entire category is a category of uh, applications and solutions which are designed to be used by your customers rather than your employees. And the differences are important at every level, but especially when it comes to attacks. Now, guess how many differences I'm going to mention about the two scenarios. This fell flat. You are a very difficult crowd. <laughs> Here are a few things uh, to think about, about uh, how CIM is different from workforce. The first one, I'd say, is signal entropy. If you think about uh, analyzing attacks for workforce, it's kind of easy. You have uh, the usual John that shows up with a MacBook assigned from IT and uh, connects from that particular IP at that particular time and opens the same list of applications and then breaks for lunch. And it's all the same, usually. It, or at least it's pretty consistent. And the John is not very difficult from N. All your employees, more or less, are within a certain bounding box. But if you are looking at CIM, you will end up uh, with uh, all sorts of different things. You'll have people with uh, multiple devices, which are, of course, completely unmanaged, that will connect in uh, whatever mechanism they'll do. And uh, if you are a streaming service, you will have a different experience from a hospital 
which will be a different experience from uh, a uh, uh, financial advisor portal, which will be different from the, the local uh, uh, Instacart or whatever. So really, signal entropy is uh, extremely high. Like, it's very hard to find things that are common, and often they are hyper-local. Let's say that you need to pick one specific scenario and try to learn as much as you can of that particular one. And cross-pollination is really hard to achieve. The other is just the attack surface. Like, no one walks at Goldman Sachs and say, I work here now. You get onboarded by the recruiters and uh, the IT department and HR and all of that stuff. Whereas, if you want to be a frequent flyer, you can be. You just land uh, on the website of your favorite airline and you sign up. They sign up is a part of uh, the attack surface which simply does not exist in workforce. And on top of this, even for the things that are common, what happens is that uh, the tolerance that uh, the users will have for difficult experiences is very low. That's to say that your employee is a hostage of your IT department. If they want to be paid twice a month, they better deal with whatever IT throws in their direction. But your customer is a few clicks away from something else. So in terms of surface, you have this balance that you need to achieve between eliminating as much friction as possible, but also adding that friction when the risk starts winning against the gains. And then the other part is scale and duration. Very often, when you attack workforce, you try to be as sneaky as possible, you do spare head phishing, you search to compromise the power account. Whereas in the context of CIM, the attacks, as we'll see in the examples, can be extremely loud, like uh, people just don't care. The attackers will just throw everything they have at you. And, uh, there is relatively little you can do. Of course, like, there are ways of, uh, how to say, containing the attack, but uh, there is no advantage for them in being sneaky apart from specific sub-scenarios. And there is more stuff, but the template only had three. OK, so first of the uh, attacks that I want to dive a bit deeper into is uh, fraudulent registrations. As I mentioned, a Pretty much every CIM uh, uh, system has a way of adding uh, um, users, that are, like self-service adding users or organizations. Why would someone want to do something, something like this? There are multiple reasons. You can uh, think of situations in which uh, there are special editions of uh, items that can be sold only one per household. And so registering works. Or there might be incentives, campaigns that give you something if you sign up for that particular system. There might be systems that allow you to comment on things or uh, write posts. And so having an army of bots is useful to spread fake news and stuff like that. Or there might be a um, competitor that you really don't like and you want to exhaust their resources or do bad things from their uh, domains. So, there are a number of reasons for which you might want to do this. And it's really not rocket science. Here there will be bots, typically, because you need some CPU time and some connectivity that will attack this thing and you will end up with accounts. Very simple. And I have a one particular example here, which uh, um, I, of course, cannot, like, all my examples are as anonymized as we can because we don't want to talk about specific customers. But this one in particular was in um, a crypto exchange. Crypto exchange are like uh, operating in the context of crypto. And what they did was uh, they did a promotion and they basically said, if you sign up with us, we're going to give you some tokens of our buffer. And so, and here you'll note, I know that some of you are very observant. You'll note that there is uh, no bottom axis. That's by design because uh, we don't want to give you too many details about uh, this thing. But uh, this happened in the uh, arc of a few weeks. What happened is that uh, they started their operation and then they announced that they were having uh, this promotion. And then almost immediately, like they started ripping the benefits of more uh, registrations and then suddenly they got flooded by registrations. And here, like, uh, 
in order to be very malicious, that means that uh, you need to have done 10 attempts from one particular IP in one day that failed. So the bar for considering a malicious attempt is very high. And those guys basically did this until they completely drained the wallet of a promotion. And then they rested because there was no more money to be made. And then uh, the poor crypto exchange people said, OK, we were unlucky. Let's do this again. And so they replenished their wallet and uh, they opened it up. Want to guess what happened next? Boom. They showed up again. They drained the wallet. I rolled the R on purpose. And, uh, and then they disappeared. As in uh, the promotion, like, of course, at that point, the crypto exchange said, OK, enough uh, sinking money into this. And they disappeared. And you know what's the challenge here? If you have a breach of some kind, um, you go to the FBI. And the FBI tries to help. But if this happens, there is no one you can go to. Like, it's kind of like, yeah, you put this thing out, and people sign it up exactly what you wanted. So there is no law that has been infringed. So this is one of the big challenges that we have in this context, that this is simply abusing a system which is there by design. And it also highlights the difficulty of uh, the easier you make it to sign, to sign up, the easier those attacks will succeed. So there is a very difficult balance to be achieved in there. And uh, we'll see later that uh, there are things that you can do to help, but uh, it's still it's a difficult situation. Now, if we zoom out a bit, and I know that that is a bit of the eye chart, but given some slides I've seen in the last two days, I don't feel particularly guilty. <laughs> I can always take a picture and zoom on your phone. Um, here, like, uh, let's look at, in general, in the, like last year, what happened uh, through various uh, verticals. So here the percentage of uh, um, attacks. And I do it slowly so that you can guess. Can you guess? Did you guess which ones are going to be the top? You didn't guess. It was too fast. I should have done it too so, uh, slower. So basically, you go from uh, rounding errors, like uh, transport, salute, transport, uh, which basically nothing happens, to utility in financial services in which the majority of registrations are fraudulent registrations. So this is a very significant issue. And if you look at the year over year, here, like, unfortunately, this chart was uh, made early in the year, so we didn't have all the data. But now that we have all the data, I can, well, all the data, more data up to now, I can tell you that last year, globally, 15% of all registrations were fraudulent. This year, same period, 24%. So they're going up pretty significantly. The other thing that uh, you can see from this is exactly what you cannot see. There is no discernible pattern. This stuff is smash and grab. When there is an opportunity, people will show up and uh, try to do what they can to take advantage of uh, some local opportunity, like the one that I said earlier. But in the general case, there is no seasonality, whereas for the next one, we'll see that uh, there is. OK, that was fraudulent registrations. Now, credential stuffing, which I assume you are all familiar with, but it's the thing that happens when an attacker takes known credentials from a site and tries to use it with another site in the hope that the user reuse exactly the same username and password. And here you can do it in multiple flavors. You can do things like uh, what is called bursting. So you throw as much as you can uh, with, uh, like you try a massive attack at a very large scale. You can try uh, trickling, which basically means you try to do just enough to stay beyond the detection threshold. Or you can do sprinkling, in which basically it's uh, um, you do some of those attempts, and then uh, you mix it with some known credentials, which will succeed, so that you throw out the logic that says uh, this thing is only uh, trying to use fraudulent uh, um, components. And again, here the diagram. You have a botnet. It hits you, and eventually it will uh, come out with something useful. The case study here is a financial institution in, uh, I think, South America. And basically what happens in here is that uh, um, they got really like uh, one very paradigmatic attack, like uh, 
one classic attack that you would not see for workforce, but that is definitely something that uh, uh, is typical of CIM. And here, given that my designers are evil, they decided to swap the colors just to see whether you pay attention. So now the malicious is green and the yellow is the fine ones. Are you out of balance yet? So here, basically, for something like one month of observation, everything was fine. You could see some malicious activity there, but like uh, running errors, nothing particularly significant. More exploration than anything else. And then it started, and basically every day for two months, they had from five to 10 times uh, malicious traffic versus normal traffic for two months, relentless. When they had that little hole in there, who knows what happened? Maybe they didn't pay their uh, subscription to the botnet. Who knows? But uh, anyway, the point is, uh, for two months, with no attempt of being subtle, they just pounded on this service. And then, just like they appeared, they disappeared forever. You don't get this kind of stuff for workforce. And whatever mechanism you have, which might be designed to do early detection for advanced spare head and similar, will simply not work to face something like this. Now, if we go back to something similar before, like for the verticals, here I just sorted in percentage the uh, percentage of traffic due to credential staffing attempts versus uh, regular traffic. And I just uh, made uh, the first, uh, like the long tail uh, without uh, spending much, uh, a lot of time on it because I think that uh, the in more interesting parts are the top five or maybe even the top three or top two. So SAS is one of the most attacked, is more than 40%, which is significant. Uh, hospitality, also more or less in the same place. Entertainment, no surprise, like uh, accounts for Netflix that uh, if you get charged for less than what Netflix charges you are actually pretty valuable. And does anyone want to guess the, the last two, top two? Finance. Ta-da! If I'd have a prize, it would be yours, but my budget is uh, null, so. You have only my congratulations. But what about the top one? Which one is the top? Come on. Elf, like Jill Galdor. Half. I think half is already there. So, nope. It's a retail. It's a retail. And interestingly, if you actually look at the year over year, now we're going to see patterns. If you look at the first few months, we see that little pattern. Why do we see that peak at that time? In April? Is uh, Prime Day in April? Taxes. Who said taxes? Hey, I'll, uh, I'll buy you a drink at the party. And the next. OK, this time, yes. It's right before Black Friday and the various uh, uh, retail stuff. So for credential staffing, we do see some seasonality. And here, we just don't have ain't anyone got the time for that. But uh, in the report, you will find uh, that uh, different regions in the world will have pretty significant differences. So for credential staffing, indeed, there are really interesting patterns that I recommend you check out. So here, I just give you a couple of examples which are pretty loud, like show pretty clearly that CIM is a different beast than uh, workforce. In terms of what you can do about it, you can operate uh, at mostly three levels. There is the user level, in which, uh, depending on uh, the technique that you use for sending in users, you will make some of those attacks more or less likely. So for example, clearly, if you use an uh, unfishable mechanism, you'll be in a better position than if you don't. Um, in terms of application level, there is a large collection of things that you can do in order to uh, contain some of those attacks. Um, and I won't go through the list of these because David showed me the magic five-minute thingy. 
but uh, you are all familiar with this, what are some of the reasons for which uh, you are usually better off using a cloud-based service? Because uh, the cloud-based service learns what's uh, going on on other tenants, and then it can protect yours with that uh, particular intelligence. At network level, you can have uh, block lists, allow lists, like uh, it's still, it's, uh, like it's not as fashionable, but it's still uh, definitely a good tool. Here, I want to give you an example of actually deploying one of those uh, countermeasures. Here, we had a customer that got uh, a, bit, a, a big uh, a credential staffing attempt, as you can see in there. And we deployed bot detection, which inserted a captcha every time we got a bot. And as you can see, boom, things fell off pretty dramatically. But then, after a while, they just switched attack. They started using a refresh token replay. So it's an arms race. And in fact, uh, one of the things that uh, we think is that uh, these arms race will keep escalating. And uh, one way of getting out of it is uh, to use unfishable uh, technologies. And in fact, uh, here, I'm going to give you an ultra fast demo of uh, how there is no excuse for not using this kind of stuff. Now, we have still in lab this feature, but basically what we have added in our system under the password options. Uh, we added a simple switch which says, uh, if you are capable of doing uh, um, passkeys, use passkeys. Did you say something about the uh, network connectivity not going particularly well? Looks like. Okay. So here it's a simple switch. Your developer just goes there and says, I want to use passkey. And then what happens is that once you go in your application, which is like, OK, and uh, you say that you want to sign up for something, this is a very uh, unsettling. And here, you, you just like, use the technique that you would normally use for authenticating with username and password. Once you click, you continue. Given that I am on a, on a passkey capable device, I just get prompted to create a passkey. I create it and I get signed in right away. Network permitting, of course. OK. And now if I sign out, and I try to sign in again. Once I get in here, I get my little passkey. So there is really no, um, like we were talking about, uh, thank you, thank you. In terms of uh, um, usability of these, in terms of like adoption, my users that are using passwords will be none the wiser that this is happening for the users that can support Passkey. And from the point of view of the developer, this is just an OpenID website. This is a website which is using an OpenID provider. So truly, there is no excuse for not uh, um, starting to uh, actually use uh, Passkey's web often and similar. So if you want to dig deeper, this was super short. Uh, there is the white paper. I highly recommend that you download it. We are on Twitter, so you can hear about new white papers. I'm on Twitter as well. I'm more responsive on Twitter than on email, because when you send an email, no one knows you did. But on Twitter, you shame me publicly, so you use it wisely. And uh, um, what we said at the very beginning, we said that workforce identity is not the same as CIM, so you need to do something else. There are lots of things that you can do, the best one of those being unfishable stuff. And, uh, Exactly that. And here I'm lying. There is no Q&A because we run out of time. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have more time. We've got another session to start in just a couple minutes. But thank you very much, Vittorio. Excellent. <laughs>